I forgot to film an intro for this review, so as recompense, here is just a little showcase of the things you might have seen on my shelf in the past videos. So here we have, well, it's a shark. This was a souvenir I picked up from Hilton Head Island when I was like five or six. So yeah, I've had this thing for like pretty much 20 years. It's just been by my side for that long. Um, this is what happened to Mr. Puff. That's an ammonite fossil. Everything on this shelf has a nautical theme in honor of my novel, Hell's Gulf. Up here on the top shelf, we have a giraffe that is carved out of an antelope bone. This is an obelisk of quartz. Very cool. Here is a hand-carved wooden cobra from Jamaica. This is one of my favorite things, actually. I've also had this for pretty much 20 years. And this is my Plague Doctor mask. I wear it for uh, Halloween parties, uh, Renaissance festivals, and um, other purposes. Um, review time! A power surge causes Astrid's buddy Tronic doll to malfunction, leaving it horribly disfigured. But a bout of guilt convinces her to keep the doll, named Nexi. As the two grow close and learn more about each other, Nexi begins to question her own unseemly appearance, and seems to yearn for Astrid's beauty. Maybe a little too much. I'm gonna be honest, when I saw the cover for this one, I thought it was gonna be textbook Blackbird Syndrome. The last time we saw a creepy little girl doll was 1.35 a.m., which I didn't realize at the time, but that was patient zero for Blackbird Syndrome. So I went in with low expectations, and uh, I was surprised. Because not only was it not Blackbird Syndrome, but it did something with the story that I thought was very interesting and hit me on a personal level. If you remember back to Friendly Face, I trashed that story for taking what I thought was an amazing concept and infecting it with Blackbird Syndrome, and I wondered how cool it would be if the protagonist had to alternatively keep this abomination he'd made and learn to live with it. And they do that in Nexi. Instead of Astrid predictably abandoning the doll and having it stalk her throughout the rest of the story, uh, she keeps it and learns to adapt to its ugliness. And they have these actually compelling discussions about what it means to be beautiful and whether or not Nexi is beautiful, despite her being disproportionate and malformed and ill-tempered. Great stuff. Seriously, this is the sort of like deep humanistic existentialism I expected out of Friendly Face. Now, granted, a creepy little girl doll isn't nearly as creative as whatever the hell Friendly Face was, but uh, hey, I'll take my victories where I can get them. And the ending is suitably creepy. Nexi leads Astrid to a back room with a pair of scissors, <laughs> and Astrid comes back to school the next day, but it's actually Nexi's endoskeleton wearing Astrid's flayed skin. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Now granted, this does fit the criteria for another disease I proposed, uh, phasmiasis, where the antagonist uh, goes inside slash attempts to become the protagonist. But here it actually works because not only is it very effective, but it also fits the themes discussed in the story. So I'll withhold a diagnosis for now. Sadly, there's one issue with this story that keeps it from attaining greatness. Uh, there's actually two POVs, uh, one from Astrid and one from one of her classmates named Remy who has feelings for her. Remy has absolutely zero impact on the plot. I don't think he and Astrid even share a line of dialogue. You could have cut him out from the story entirely and nothing would have changed. I get that the purpose is to provide an alternate perspective from when Nexi acts up and attacks Astrid's bullies, but I still think there are ways you could have conveyed that without having to rely on a completely useless POV. Also, let's talk about the Buddytronics. Uh, sentient, three-foot-tall Fazbear characters that follow the kids around and are taken to school regularly. N now, don't get me wrong, I'm not mad about the fact that they're three-foot-tall sentient robots. I'm mad that they're allowed to go to school without consequence to the kids. When I was in fourth grade, we weren't allowed to bring in Bakugan. They were banned from the school. 
if you were caught with one, they'd get confiscated and you would lose conduct points. Now you're telling me that these kids in the story can basically just bring hyper-intelligent cyborgs with them to school without consequence? What a load of faz shit. But other than that, Nexi is a very solid story and a pleasant surprise after so much middling quality. Nexty. Wait. During a trip to the Pizzaplex, Kara breaks off from her friends to try out the new AR attraction, but she finds herself trapped in an endless world of swimming pools and water slides, compounded with a ghostly drowned girl that seems hellbent on pulling her under. Kara fears that she will never escape the simulation or find the truth behind the wrathful spirit. Oh boy, another AR story. I'm so excited. We all know how good the last one turned out to be. In some ways, this one's an improvement. For one, Kara is aware she's in a simulation the whole time, so that annoying, is it real trope is thankfully absent. Two, this environment she finds herself in, this never-ending labyrinth of old pools and water slides, does make for some very stellar atmosphere, especially when she finds the old waterlogged, decrepit houses. Uh, there's something that's just so eerie about places that have been ravaged by water. I, I can't explain it, but it's still great stuff. Three, the aforementioned ghost girl isn't exactly an original idea, but it's a huge upgrade from whatever the hell the jelly people were. Uh, some genuinely creepy imagery and happenings from that thing. However, the story isn't without its problems. For one, the reason Kara's trapped is because she requested hypertime, an actual shot of adrenaline that's supposed to prolong your experience in the simulation, and they leave it on a setting that makes the effects last indefinitely. Why are we shooting up kids with adrenaline? Why is there even a setting that makes the effects last forever? <laughs> this is some clinic of horror shit. Guess we could add hypertime to the list of plankton palsy symptoms. See, this is what I'm talking about. These stories require these huge leaps of realism to actually function as the stories they're trying to tell. And they have to rely on these convoluted setups and diabolical technologies that only serve to take you out of the experience. Oh, there's this setting that you should never put it on, but I'm gonna put you in a position where it can be accidentally triggered because you're cute, and I'm just gonna leave for minutes on end. What could possibly go wrong? Dramatic tension, horror, story. Tales from the Pizzaplex. The other thing, uh, this ghost girl. For context, Kara had a cousin named Peggy when they were kids, and uh, they were both climbing a tree, and Peggy went out too far, and she fell out of the tree, cracked her head open, and fucking died. So Kara feels guilt about not potentially doing anything to stop her, which kind of extends to what she feels about the ghost girl. I thought that's where they were going, that the ghost girl was a manifestation of Kara's guilt and or Peggy herself, but no, that's not what happens. Kara finds a framed black and white picture of the girl from presumably the mid 20th century, which implies that the spirit truly came from an outside source and infected the game. So, who is she? The wiki says that some fans believe it's Cassidy, but let's be honest, you don't know who she is. And hot take, I don't think even the authors know who it is. Maybe it will be revealed in a later story. Ooh. And that's the other thing I'm talking about. They can just flat out not elaborate on things because maybe it will be revealed in a later story or maybe it's the yeah. lore. Why do I get the feeling that the authors and yes, that includes Scott Cawthon just use the yeah. lore as an excuse to write about whatever the hell they want without consequence because they know that the fans will just take it as a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Well, luckily I have the answer right here. Let's find out. Really though, why did I expect any different? 
It's like some demented science experiment where you're told that the prize is behind the door, but every time you try and open it, the handle shocks you, and you just keep getting shocked over and over and over again, and eventually you're all like, do I keep trying and maybe I won't get shocked, or do I give up and abandon the potential of the prize? <laughs> So yeah, a nice atmosphere and some creepy imagery, but it could not make up for the story problems it had. Um, a, a good story makes you think about it long after you set it down. Well, I certainly thought about this one for a long time. Just not in the way they wanted me to. Next! Decades in the past, Edwin and his young son David live in an abandoned factory while he builds robots for Fazbear Entertainment. Overwhelmed by his work, Edwin creates an animatronic that learns via mimicking to keep his son David company. But a tragic accident compels Edwin to take out his wrath upon the animatronic, thus condemning it to re-emerge years later to spark a new reign of terror. Finally, the mimic's backstory, and it's good. The first half of this story is the strongest. Uh, I really liked the strained, difficult dynamic between Edwin and his four-year-old son, David. You could really feel the weight of his work and the struggles of being a single father just crushing him constantly. I liked the concept of the mimic, how it learns by copying what people are doing. That's a pretty cool trope, the creature that's dangerous because it's only following orders to an extreme degree. We saw something kind of similar in Haps, but really, uh, this story reminded me much more of Fetch. Remember that all the way back in Fazbear Frights? Then David gets hit by a truck. Yeah, it, that just kind of came right the hell out of nowhere. Just like that truck. You know that's happened like three times in the Faz books at this point. Uh, new disease dropping? Uh, get hit by a truck-itis? Eh, maybe not at this point. Now Edwin's stuck with a mimic who just keeps relaying all the actions it's learned from David, which just reminds him of his son, and Edwin just snaps and beats the living hell out of the mimic, destroying it, basically. I I'm not much for theorizing, but I think that Edwin inadvertently infected it with agony when he did that. We saw something similar with uh, the Charlie bot and the Stitch Wraith. My big issue with the first half, that the payoff that was built up in the Storyteller just wasn't as profound as I thought it would be. The thing that killed David was a freak accident. I truly expected it to be at least indirectly connected to the Mimic. And the reason why Edwin has traumatic uh, episodes from the tiger's head in the Storyteller is because David had a stuffed tiger that looked like it. Um, callback, I guess. Now I get to the second half of the story, where three Fazbear Entertainment goons are sent to the factory to clean up Edwin's mess. Uh, I, I honestly forgot their names. Oh, except Dominic. Why? Because on one page they misspell his name as Dominic! Were you people writing these Faz books on napkins, for Christ's sake? Look, as I was writing the script, the little red line appeared under the word Dominic. <laughs> ah! It's so fucking stupid. <laughs> but anyway, the Mimic picks off the three guys one at a time, and it is actually really cool because the way the Mimic kills them, it's reminiscent of all the behaviors that it mimicked from David. Uh, one guy is stuffed in the refrigerator, one guy is hung in the closet, and the Mimic has a penchant for, like, disguising itself as various costumes lying around the factory because that's what David used to do just to play pranks on his dad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked stuff right there. Overall, this was a good story. The horror and the heart were pretty much on point. Uh, I only wish that the payoff to the callbacks was stronger. Eh, oh well. Some really good gore in this one, too. Kind of like the epilogues. Oh yeah, the epilogues. What happens here? They trap the mimic in a room and Jace dies. That's what happens. Yeah, I I'm starting to get a bit annoyed by these epilogues now. It, it really seems like they're trying to stretch it out as far as they can, just to fill up space. I will say that I think something's fishy about Kelly, and I am enjoying the Mimic a lot more than Eleanor as an antagonist, both in concept and how it interconnects with the rest of the stories. And, um... That's it. Um... I never thought this day would come, but I am officially caught up with the Faz books. 
Wow. Uh, yeah, so the, the next one, I think it's called Tiger Rock. It comes out in July, I think. So you can expect the review to come out not long after that book debuts. I also had a bit of a dilemma because when I review these Faz books, I just go straight into spoiler territory because up until this point, the books had been out for months to years. So I didn't really care about talking about the ending or plot twist or whatever. And I thought, um, should, I, should I withhold from talking about spoilers when I review these upcoming recently released books? Um, no, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I, I review these books as books, uh, I, and that means talking about plot points and endings and all that, so I'm just gonna stick to my guns. Uh, for the recent releases, I'm going to include spoiler tags just for the courtesy of people who uh, maybe are in the middle of reading them or haven't read them yet, so... Um, yeah, um, I will see you all next time. Um, there's gonna be a bit of a gap between this video and the Tiger Rock video. Uh, I'll try and put out more content. Maybe I'll make more Outlast stuff. I'll put out some, maybe try and put out at least one video essay before that happens. Uh, hope you all stick around. Uh, like, I, like I said many times before, I do a lot more than just Faz books. I uh, have a lot of uh, ambitions, a lot of interests. I hope you all can enjoy the rest of my content uh, disconnected from FNAF. So I will see you all next time, whenever that is.